front of you. I'm preaching the whole chapter this morning. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, their firstborn son, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. What we see, what we have seen in chapter 3 is Adam and Eve falling, not just doing a mistake, but forcefully, decidedly, willfully eating of a fruit of the forbidden tree. Don't eat of that fruit, God said, because if you eat of it, you will surely die. The serpent comes along, lies to them, they fall for it, they are tempted by the fruit itself, they desire it, she takes it, takes a bite, gives it to Adam. He does not protest, he does not intervene, he takes it as well. God comes looking for them, he curses the serpent, and he, he uh, puts a, a, a punishment upon uh, the two of them. You'll, you'll bear child, uh, children in pain, and you will have to work hard for anything and everything you want, he tells Adam. But what we see here is quite beautiful, actually, in verses 1 and 2, because we see, a, in my view, a repentant Adam and Eve, that they go back to what God said, even before, do not eat of that, uh, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. <coughs> Because what did he say them, to them? What was the first command to do something? God told them to be fruitful and to multiply. <coughs> now, Adam and Eve could have gone, we're, we're not doing that. We're going to end the human race here. We don't want them to be born into this sinful world. We have experienced perfection and goodness. And because of our sin, we have fallen into this terrible state. Look at all the thorns. And Don't you hate stingy nettles? I have to, I'm sweating. It's hot. I can feel the sun. It's not the way it was. We don't want to bring children into this world, but instead they turn around and they, they do bear sons. They are <coughs> faithful to God's first command, which is to be fruitful and multiply. And Eve's response to the birth of Cain, her firstborn son in verse 1, it indicates that she's looking for that seed that was promised in chapter 3, verse 15. Now, chapter 3, verse 15, God tells the serpent who tempted them, he says, I will put enmity, a rivalry, strife, between you and the woman, between your offspring, or seed, and her offspring, or seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, there's a promise there. There's grace there. There's hope there. And you can see Eve clinging to that. She is she, she's, uh, looking for that seed, that hope, that promise. And so when Cain is born, she says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And then Abel, we learn, it was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And we are then reminded of Adam's responsibility in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and he was told to work and keep the ground. And so that carries on with Cain and Abel. But what I want us to, to see, first of all, is the first ever sacrifice done by a human, or the first two offerings offered to God, given to God, as far as we know. We, it may well have been that Adam and Eve were offering or sacrificing animals to the Lord. We don't know. It doesn't say. But as far as we know, this would have been the first occasion that man would have sacrificed to God. Look at verses 1 through 16. In verse 3, it says, in the course of time. So, when some time had passed by, some years had gone past. Now, Cain and Abel are men at this point. They are working men. We don't know how many years, how much time has passed, but they're fully grown. And at that time, whatever time that is, and they lived for, for hundreds of years back then, for some reason, the pair of them had decided to bring an offering to God. God, we want to bring you an offering, right? two offerings by two separate men. Look at verses three, uh, uh, verse 7 of chapter 3. 
uh, sorry, yeah, go back to chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, this is what I want us to, to, to notice uh, first about Cain's offering. At first, it seems odd that God would reject Cain's offering, right? Cain offers fruit from the ground, something that he's grown, and he's proud of it, and he takes it as an offering to God. And God rejects it. It says he has no regard for Cain's offering. It seems odd why God should do that. But let's go back to chapter 3, verse 7. What Adam and Eve did, once they'd sinned, is that they noticed that they were naked. In other words, they were ashamed of themselves and each other, and they tried to resolve that. So they, there was an opportunity to sin. They chose to sin. They fell into sin, and they noticed that they were naked. They were ashamed of themselves. So they then tried to run around and stop this try to undo it. So they found the biggest leaf that they could do in Palestine. The fig tree has the biggest leaves. And so they sew a, um, a garment or something out of fig leaves just to try and cover themselves. But it's not adequate. And we know that because in chapter 3, verse 21, we saw this last week, <coughs> we saw that their own covering wasn't good enough. So God clothed them himself. But he clothed them with the skin of an animal. Chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. What we learn here is that in order for us to be accepted by God in our sinful state in which we dwell now, someone else or something else has to pay the price for our sins so that we can be purified from ours and therefore be accepted by God. What they had covered themselves with, the fig leaves, was not acceptable. Someone had to die, something had to die in order to cover their shame, which is what we saw last week. So God takes the life of an animal and takes the skin of the animal and covers them so that something has died so that their shame can be removed. Do you see the picture? So what we see with Cain and Abel, Abel gets it, Cain doesn't get it. Cain offers fruit of the ground, it's a nice gift, but what Abel does is he takes the life of an animal, of another, because he knows that I cannot come to God the way I am. I cannot be accepted the way that I am. God cannot look upon me in my sinful state. Someone has to pay the price for what I have done. And so what he does is he takes the life of the firstborn of his stock, livestock, and sacrifices that, and, and fat portions as well, the things that smell nice on the animal, and offers that to God, saying, in effect, I can only worship you if I understand that someone else has to pay the price for my sins. That's what Abel does, but Cain doesn't do that. Cain simply brings a gift. And you could say, well, he had good intentions. I don't think so. Both men would have known the story of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Both men would have been lectured by their parents about what was required to be forgiven, to have their shame covered. But Abel had a more severe view of sin than Cain did. Abel knew what it takes. Cain knew, but didn't want to offer that. He didn't have a very high view or a very low view of his sin. Cain, just like his parents, tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, chooses fruit from the ground. Let's talk about gifts. When we give gifts... The more expensive gifts or the gifts that are more fun or nice to look at, we give them to the people we care about most. True? Ken's nodded. Thank you. If you didn't nod, you're lying. We spend more on those we love the most. Right? Libby gets everything. Right? Libby gets, if I buy a gift at Christmas, Libby gets the nicest gifts. Everyone else comes after. So it's probably Libby... Uh, for Libby, me, then we, we'd go parents, uh, then we'd go siblings, although 
I've got two brothers. We've got a pact from years ago. We don't buy gifts for each other because we've basically admitted it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's links or deodorant or something. So we've, we've said, look, let's not do this. It's a waste of money. Let's just say Merry Christmas. So that's what we do. Uh, you could say that, well, that's not very loving. Hey, make of that what you want. But the point I'm making is we give the best gifts to the people we love the most. And if we truly love someone, we want to give them something very, very special. And what comes out of our wallets reflects what is in our hearts. The frightening thing is this. We are still required to sacrifice today. Do you know that? The Bible teaches us to sacrifice today, but in a slightly different way. Don't worry. Tom the shepherd's not going to bring in a lamb this morning. That's not what I mean. In the Old Testament, the quality of their sacrifices led to their being accepted. So it had to be a ram, the firstborn, uh, uh, the best of the flock, uh, not a spotted lamb, but an unblemished lamb. lamb. A lamb or a ram or a sheep or a goat or a, or, a, or a cow or a pigeon, the best of the lot. And that's what you offer to God, showing that I want you, O oh Lord, to have the best that there is. The best that I have to give belongs to God. The more you understand the love of God and the gospel, the more you will want to sacrifice for the Lord. Now, when I talk about sacrifice, I don't mean killing animals. But we are required to sacrifice time, effort, money, our homes, hospitality, anything and everything that God has given to us we are to give to Him, back to Him, to others. We are to sacrifice that which God has given to us. Cain doesn't. Cain doesn't. He does not want, he is not bothered about what it takes to be accepted. He simply thinks that this will be enough. In Luke chapter 21, and we've pre I've preached through Luke, and you can go and listen to it online if you want. I've got a whole sermon on this. But Luke 21 verses 1 to 4, uh, Jesus is at the temple and he's noticing all the, all the rich people giving gifts and things. And, and this is what it says, Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. It says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than any of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. You see, it's not the sacrifice of Cain that God rejected. It's not the fruit that God rejected. It wasn't the quality of the gift. And it's not the sacrifice, the quality of the lamb, really, that Abel offered that God accepted. Rather, what God accepts is the heart of Abel, and what he rejects is the heart of Cain. Abel understood the gospel. He knew what was required to pay for his sins. Cain, in understanding the gospel, rejected it. He wanted to give the amount that he decided to give. And what came after exposed the heart of Cain even more. Look at verses 5 to 7. But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. God is talking about this idea of being accepted. If you do well, you'll be accepted. If you don't do well, you won't be accepted. God had warned Cain about his sin here. Before God even punished Cain, he gives him an opportunity, another opportunity, to change, to repent, to be transformed. But the sin in his heart was too great. In the face of a merciful God, God offering mercy, Cain's self-righteous anger 
grew and grew. In verse 8 to 10, it says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, took his life, killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, now this is interesting, God knows where Abel is. We know that because he says it in a couple of sentences later, but he asks him, where is Abel, your brother? Come clean. Look at his answer. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> if you're a teacher, uh, Libby was a teacher, you would have had children answer you back like that. The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I want you to notice the parallel between verses 8 to 10 of chapter 2. Oh, sorry, verses 8 of 10 of, of this chapter, and then verses 9 to 10 of chapter 3. So, in verses 9 to 10 of chapter 3, God asks Adam, after Adam and Eve had sinned, where are you? And then here in verses 9 to 10, God asks Cain, where is your brother Abel? And in verses 8 to 10 of, chapter, uh, of this chapter, uh, God asks Cain, what have you done? Whereas in verses 9 to 10 of chapter 3, God asks Adam, who told you that you were naked? There's a parallel here. It's a pattern of sin that Cain has just taken from his parents. Cain's response, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. Am I? It's a sin of lie, first of all. They're saying he doesn't know. He, he knows exactly where he is. It's a sin of disagreeability with God. He doesn't agree that God asks him this question. And it's a sin of acquittal, unwilling to be honest about it. After giving Cain an opportunity to repent and Cain refusing to, God then has to deal with the sin and curses Cain. Ground, the ground will no longer yield its strength. It won't be the way it was. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer but even in the face of God's anger, he is still merciful to Cain. Look, verses 13 to 15. Cain said to the Lord, look at him coming crying now, Oh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground. God has done nothing. He's driven himself away, isn't he? And from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. He's concerned about himself all the time. And even in the face of God cursing him, he is still merciful. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. God preserved his life in the face of judgment and banishment. And what I want to uh, teach you a phrase, many of you would know it. Common grace. Everybody say common grace. Thank you. I hope that's woken you up a little bit. Common grace. In verse 16, it says, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. That's common grace. Common grace is the grace of God to everybody. Everybody who is alive at this moment is experiencing, experiencing God's common grace, meaning... It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what you look like, where you're from, you are allowed to live your life in the time that God has given you. You can enjoy food, you can make money, you can buy houses, property, you can invest, you can enjoy all that God has given you under His common grace, but away from the presence of the Lord. That's common grace. We are all under common grace common grace, until we receive God's special grace, which is more than that, which is saying, not only in this life will you enjoy what is good, but also in the next, because you have given all that's good to me. And that's the nature of sacrifice, is that we realize all that I have and am belongs to God, because all that He has, has been given to me through His Son. It also teaches us here how we deal with death. 
This is how we make sense of why good things happen to bad people and why bad things happen to those who love the Lord. Why didn't God intervene here? Why couldn't he stop Cain from murdering Abel? If God is God, all-powerful, knew this would happen, why didn't he stop it? And we ask this question about everything. Why couldn't he stop my husband, wife, friend, parent having cancer? Why does he allow rape? Why does he allow poverty? Why doesn't God intervene in these things? But in this case, why couldn't God just stop Cain from murdering Abel? Why couldn't he intervene? Let me ask you this. Who's better off in this passage? Cain or Abel? The one who lives away from the presence of God would say Cain because he gets to live his life and enjoy whatever is left. But the Christian, the Christian would say Abel. For the Christian, death is gain, not loss. Cain is allowed to grow old and enjoy family, have children, multiply on the earth while Abel's blood is on the ground and his legacy came to an end. But did it? Did Abel's legacy come to an end? Look at Abel's legacy. Abel's legacy was left in his sacrifice because it leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Abel was the one who offered the first righteous sacrifice, which was enough to be accepted because he understood the gospel. Jesus might not have been born of Abel's descendants, but Abel's sacrifice was the first to foreshadow the coming of Christ. Let me tell you something about Old Testament sacrifices. In Exodus 11, the next book on, God requires a sacrifice for the, of the first, um, in order for the firstborn son to be saved. So, in, uh, the, the, in Exodus, the story is that um, the Israelites... Uh, in our uh, slaves in Egypt, and Moses is raised up by God as a leader to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. They're in the desert for 40 years. So, what do you, what, the 10 plagues come upon Pharaoh and, and uh, Egypt to try and get him to tap out, to say, okay, that's enough, you can go. The last one is that the firstborn son of every person and every animal in Egypt will die unless you offer an acceptable sacrifice and paint the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house, and God will pass over, and it's called the Passover, and the firstborn son will be accepted. And so what we see here in Abel's sacrifice is that he sacrifices the firstborn, the firstborn, ever uh, since... Uh, in times following the, the Exodus, the Passover, in Exodus 13, for example, it tells us that God requires the firstborn child and every animal to be saved by a sacrifice. And in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 18, we are told that Christ is the firstborn of all creation and the firstborn from the dead. This means that Christ, a sacri for us to live, He is the firstborn that was offered on the cross so that we can be saved. So Abel sacrificing the firstborn is a picture that Christ, the firstborn of all creation, would also be the firstborn from the dead, that He would sacrifice Himself so that we can live. Abel understood it. He got it. He had to give the firstborn so that he could be saved. For us to be saved, God has to give the firstborn his own son so that we can be saved. And that's Abel's legacy. Compared to Cain's legacy, what we see in Cain is that his family is awful, aren't they? A pattern of such sin. Look at verses 17 to 24. It follows Cain's family tree until we get to this fellow called Lamech in verse 23. Cain's great, great, great grandson. He murders another just like Cain did. And he says his curse, as he confesses himself, is far worse. Seventy times seven. We just see a legacy of sin continuing through Cain's family tree. Whereas Abel, Abel even though he is, his life has come to an end, he lives on with the Lord forever. 
finally, before we sing a hymn, I want us to see the first example of recreation. Adam knew that he was to have another offspring because Cain was not the seed that was referred to in Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve knew, look, Cain is, is the nightmare child. He's taken Abel. Look at the state of his family. It's a pattern of sin. The seed will not come from him. We need another. And so they give birth to a man called, a baby who became a man called Seth. And he took Abel's place. And from that point on, we learn that people began to call upon the name of the Lord in verse 26. Only from that point on did that happen. It says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And that's a beautiful thing. Why? Because they understood what sacrifice meant. They understood it. In order for me to be saved, someone else has to pay the price. Now, it's the same for us today. Look around. Look at the person next to you, in front of you, behind of you. That person is a sinner and you are a sinner. I can't come this morning and say, right, God has given me a message. I'm going to die today and your sin's going to be put on to me. That, that's nonsense because who's going to pay for mine? We need God to forgive us and it's only God that can deal with our sin. So God became man because God cannot die, but someone has to die. So by becoming man, God himself can die in the flesh. And the Lord Jesus Christ offers himself for us. We should understand it to mean that God will one day cast all those who hate him away, and those who call upon the name of the Lord shall dwell with him forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this chapter that it teaches us many things. Help us as we sacrifice to uh, offer uh, an acceptable sacrifice, not in order to be accepted, but because we have been accepted, if we have been accepted. And if there is anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, stop them from sacrificing, thinking that they can earn your acceptance by doing this or living this way or not living that way. They need the Lord Jesus who offers, offered himself as an acceptable sacrifice so that all that we offer from now on can be accepted based on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So forgive us of our sins and, and as we sing now, we do so for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us for teas and coffees through this door or that one and then turn my left. Um, there's some there's biscuits, cake. This, yeah, cake. Uh, just come and enjoy fellowship. Come and talk to us. Introduce yourself to us um, and we'll do so to you uh, uh, as well because we are a family here. I haven't chosen this family. God has brought me in and the same for everybody else.